personalities and people and speakers who speak very well. So kindly bear with me if I start a midway. Okay. Acha. So the um, as I'm a student, I'm involved with all this student activism. And these recent times, I'm very hopeful. I'm very optimistic because these recent times, especially, are seeing a spot in student movements. Be it JNU, HCU, FTIR, everywhere. Now, these movements, if we see all closely, all these movements have essentially been against the neoliberal authority, authoritarianism that is reinventing our cultural democratic spaces through discipline, through CCTV surveillance, etc., and mainly silencing and suppressing any form of student voice, any form of radical student voice. And now we are all aware that the, with the helm, at the helm we have the R, BJP and the RSS who is bent on saturnizing the syllabus, exude patriotism from all posts and basically what it is trying to do is, it is trying to drain away the critical, radical thinking that the campus is both of. In short, term every uh, diverse left opinion as anti-national so that every oppression of the state, every failure of the Modi government gets sidelined. So today I find myself standing at a very important juncture in the history of student movements. The 90s were a period of stagnation, uh, the neoliberal reforms were setting in, we saw how India opened her doors towards privatization, globalization and we slowly realized, we eventually saw how the market made the government spend less and less in social sector. This year only 1% of the GDP has been, has been assi assigned to the social sector. And all promises of inclusive development of the Modi design, Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas has failed miserably. It has refused to spare, uh, fund higher education, has made an attempt to discontinue the UGC non-net fellowship. Um, it has made desired plans of hoisting national flags across central universities which are cradles of idea and thought I think across boundaries. And so all these have been inflicted upon the people and what does the Modi regime or what does the government think that people should do? We should sit back and relax. So we had movements, we movements across campuses, people, students protesting against all these. And in turn there has been the quelling of these movements in the name of anti-nationalism, in, in the name of anti-nationalism. Now one thing I want to mention is that um, it is not only the Modi regime, but every state, every ruling power, whatever be the party at, at helm, it has always tried to criminalize dissent. Now for decent to get, to decent, for decent to come up, we need a collective space, we need a collective sharing. And what this new liberal educational paradigm has done is, it has essentially tried to curb these educational spaces, curb these collective sharings, so that no form of decent ever gets brewed up in the first place. And even if it gets brewed up, it is not allowed to organize. So we have these private colleges, Gita was mentioning them. We also have private colleges in Kolkata and I am sure all across India. So where these, these private colleges are cropping up, in these colleges, no, the students are not given the right to organize. They can't protest against the, CC, uh, they can't protest against the high fees, the CCTV surveillance, etc. In fact, every right of a student is violated there. The students never own these campuses as their own kids because it functions exactly just like a market where uh, education is brought and sold at a very high price. And what the state and what the neoliberal paradigm has done is it is curbing the spaces and every state has always tried to back these neoliberal reforms because it would best serve its interests. Uh, let me, I am from Jadupur, so let me share my experience back there. In 2010, I am aware that we had that whole cholera movement sorry, not in 2010, in 2014, we had the whole cholera movement back in Jalukpur and it was essentially, uh, uh, essentially the movement started as an investi for demanding an investigation into a molestation issue and protesting against the uh, moral policing of the authority. So what happened is that we had get out the VC and the VC had sent up local goons and police at the dead of the night and the students were mercilessly beaten up in the campus. Um, what followed was, there was a five month long protests in the campus. The state government has already, had always tried to demean the movement, the heritage that our university bears and it had been passing huge remarks everywhere and, try, and blaming the students for halting normal life in campus. So after that night we got beaten up, 16 September 2014, four days after that there had been a huge rally in Kolkata. 
Nearly one lakh students and youths had occupied the streets. Not only had they come in solidarity in Jadavpur, but actually I think that they had found a platform, um, forum where they could voice and bring forth their pent up frustration against the neoliberal regime or against that neoliberal authority which every day exploits them, in the, which every day exploits their rights in the name of CCTV, in the name of CCTV surveillance, in the form of free heights, etc. So this was Hopal Road in Jadavpur. And, uh, and then we have, we have the um, Trinamool Congress in power back in West Bengal. Not only Trinamool Congress, if I go back a little earlier, back in 2010, I was then a first year undergraduate student, and, I saw, uh, and the students then had black flagged the left chief minister of Bengal, Mr. Budhudev Bhattacharya, who had come to the campus to inaugurate a hall. And why did we do that? Because we felt that the man should not be allowed to enter the campus, because he was a mass murderer after what happened in Nongigram and Shingu. The outcome was the same. The protesters, uh, the protesters, uh, protesters were mercilessly beaten up the police. The female students were assaulted by the male police and everything. So what had been, what I am trying to say that all state, every ruling power has always this tendency to criminalize and carve dissent. It is not what the, the BJP and the RSS is just adding a new dimension to this. So they are bent on imposing the right ideology in these campuses, and why they are doing so? Because they are seeing that these campuses are now becoming the fa uh, fastly democratized site. These are the places where the Dalits and the other marginalized, co marginalized communities are not only assertive, but also they are organizing and mingling with each other and fighting for a common cause. And what to say, <laughs> all the intelligentsia money always have this left heritage in it, but I, I don't think the think tank of right, in, right, intelligence, right intelligence is totally void. So if you don't gain uh, ground inside the campuses, how will you solve this? How will you build up your entire philosophy? So this, is, this was what happened in Jadavpur. And now we have this entire scena scenario being, we know what has happened in JNU. And that is not anything new, but thanks to media and all these social, social media channels. So what happened in JNU, we have seen that sedition charges have been slapped across students who are fighting, basically who are demanding azadi from Manuva, Manuva, from patriarchy, from this Brahmanical hegemony. And these are the basic tenets that BJP and RSS actually champions. Uh, I would like to say that um, decent, uh, sorry, sedition charges is not something new. It has been a form of uh, weapon to suppress dissent a long time back. Because just only yesterday I met a comrade activist, Satish, as we are, we are, he is sitting there and he has been charged with the same sedition when the people were protesting against the Kudankula nuclear power plant back here. And it happened during the UK design. More than 325 cases, including 20 cases of sedition and waging war against the country, had been slapped across the protesters. So it is an age-old so age thing. And um, um, and after this, after what happened in JNU, we have this Kashmir and question coming up, the question of oppressed nationalities. And we have seen how retrospection into every Kashmir struggle or every oppressed nationality struggle has been termed anti-national. But this is something which is hilarious. You have to, India has tagged Kashmir with it back in 1947 and yet it does not recognize it. Um, uh, we have um, we have uh, everybody who is wanting to, and we have everybody who is speaking about this. Everybody, everything is everything has been branded as branded as anti-national. I won't go deep into this thing because I have some eminent, I have my fellow speakers who will be um, discussing discussing this topic. But what I want to say is that what is this in, this concept of nation and nationalism? What idea of nation or nationalism or, or this country is the BJP or the RSS serving? Because you have last July 2015, uh, 2015 has been 25 years of AFSPA in Kashmir. 25 years of gang rape, encounters and mass oppression in the hand of Indian army. And the same thing is happening in Manipur or similar other northeastern states. The AFSPA has been in, AFSPA has been in force in Manipur since 1958. And all this oppression going on, all this oppression is being uh, faced by the people, and what do you expect? The people to love you back, the people to love the state as a guardian. Sorry, I don't think this should be the case. So we have, um, so we have actually, we have 
uh, India boasts of such diversity, India boasts of this unity in diversity, but actually it has never tried to accumulate the diversity within it, to accumulate or acknowledge the diversity that it, uh, that it carries with it. And the doses of nationalism which the BJP and the RSS is now giving is actually a very faulty one. Because nationalism as a concept, I think, emerged back in colonial India when the people across caste, creed and ethnicity, they came forward to fight against one British colonial rule. That was nationalism. But of course, the BJP and the RSS has no glory of taking part in that struggle because what they did was they were that opportunity force who had always joined hands with the British. So they, don't, so they don't bear this glory, they don't bear this legacy. And that is why their concept of nationalism has become synonymous with a pro-Hindu state and which has got um, with distinct boundaries and symbols like the flag, the army and the etc. And never has a nationalism manifested in itself in the struggle of the people, culture and the languages. Um, and the uh, transparency of Afzal Guru's trial has been questioned by many eminent personalities back in UP and Vijayan. This is something which is not new, but discussing or mentioning it, but mentioning it, and you are being termed as an anti-national, you are termed as something which is waging war against the country. This is absolutely a violation of rights. Uh, I was going through uh, Omokrishan's interview a few, a few days back and he was saying that the people of India has not suddenly become intolerant. But in fact, it is quite the contrary. We have been tolerant towards intolerance since ages. So, so this was, uh, and however, the issue of Kashmir, as we have seen, but since I am an activist, I operate mainly in the campuses. So I have seen that, I am also very sorry for this. I have seen how the issue of Kashmir and its independence have also been sidelined by this growing national versus anti-national debate, and even major left student wings, left political parties has, has been reluctant to initiate debate on this for the fear in a fallout in votes and popularity and also because this has not been an engagement among the middle, middle class students, my mm. name, among the normal students in the campus and we can see that how this is the way our liberal conscience is actually being mediated by strong dominant political ideas. And this reluctance can only be seen as a lack because we participate in the mainstream rather than confronting it. So as an activist, as a member of a revolutionary student organization, I believe that every progressive left student organization of today should always inculcate in these critical thinking and address this question and try to, and try to take, uh, make students think about the, ways, about the ways in which politics is being done in India or the politics or the issues that politics addresses in India. And that was JNU back in HCU. We had the, uh, we have seen how the institutional mother, we have seen the institutional mother of Dalit research scholar Rohit Vemula. And this again highlights the intolerance of the BJP towards the assertion of rights by the Dalits or the other marginal, marginalized communities in India. The screening of Muzaffar Nagar Baki, we all know, had angered the AVVP and its mother party. And we saw Rohit and how the other members of the Ambedkar Student Association, they were all debarred from using the collective spaces, be it the dining or the hostel. In fact, they were being totally secluded and uh, in the campus. And, we saw, and this death of Rohit blatantly shows how the India government, by invoking an arbitrary definition of nationalism, is actually making it very hard for the marginalized communities in India to struggle and to live basically and um, we have seen how Smriti Rani has recently reacted to uh, Rohit's death. He has called Rohit as his son but unfortunately this mother in Smriti Rani was very much dormant when she was sending notices to the authority to take actions against her son Rohit Zemula and other members and as the, since this role of a mother is being so much highlighted I would rather try to bring out the irony of fate and of this patriarchal society that the very identity of Rohit as a Dalit, this was under question, this was under scanner because Rohit's mother was a Dalit but his father came from an OBC community. So basically the Rohit's identity, Rohit's struggle as a Dalit was questioned because her, his mother was not a Dalit. Mani, this is a strong instance of how our patriarchal society works today. And 
this was HCU and if you look around, if you will see that all the leading campuses of the of India, be it FTII Pune, FTII Pune saw a seven month long agitation against Gajendra Chauhan, the man with hardly any credentials and with a strong polarization towards the BJP regime. We saw um, IIT Madras, we saw how the Ambedkar Periyar study group in IIT Madras was de-recognized de and how it was termed as anti-national when it was how the teachers and the students were termed as anti-national because they were saying that because the authority was authority or the government was saying that it was actually trying to uh, inculcate hatred for Modi design through pamphlets and posters. I mean, this is all happening. I mean, this is a continuous churning of events which is taking place in recent times. And um, and not only this, another thing I would like to mention is that we, yes, we are having all these movements and another recent churning of these recent times has been since the 16 December tragedy of Nirvaya in Delhi. I have seen in Jagrubu and I have also seen in many other campuses that the assertion of the gender activists, the women are very much increasing inside, inside the campuses. Because we are, uh, the, we are questioning the institutional patriarchy. The institutional patriarchy <coughs> is being questioned now more and more. I mean, hope color of all started because of this only. Because the police or the, because the VC, the police had um, promoted moral policing. So the gender activists, the women are becoming increasingly assertive, and that is why we are, and that is why we have initiatives like Pinja Tor in Delhi, which has initially started to break the women's hostile laws, protest against the curfew timings or the moral policing of the authority, and it has eventually found itself participating in student movements all across India. It has become a platform which showcases and highlights gen gender struggles. And this has essentially shown how all struggles are related in India, be it caste, cre be it caste, religion or gender. All the struggles are essentially related. And only a few days before coming to Chennai, I saw how Rita Singh, the first woman president of Allahabad University, and she was very, she had fell again a prey to the Manuvadi regime of the BJP. And, um, and she and other female protesters were being assaulted in the campus because she had opposed the visit of Jogi something, what was his name? Aditya Yeah, Aditya Nath on the pretext that yes, he was a communal. So he was, um, so that is the thing, Mani, that this system actually, this system actually treats women to be docile subjects. When you come to the university, you get your degrees, but even if you dare to assert your presence in any space, if you dare to assert, if you dare to voice your opinion or if you try to unlock the cage that you are living in, you will be put back into your places. Um, so everywhere we are seeing that the places of dissent are shrinking, employees are being made to commercialize and saturnize the entire education, all autonomy regarding syllabus making and everything is being snatched away. And a standardization in syllabus has been introduced, is being introduced all across educational institutes and this has been mainly done to help foreign investors actually because if this education sector gets homogeneous, they are homogeneous then the private foreign investors will be the most beneficial. They will be the beneficiaries. And that is why we have seen in Delhi University has already introduced a credit based choice choice system when it does, where the students are forced to get private credits in these universities cropping up. And on the context of mobility enhancing provision, what, um, what has been done is um, it is nothing but a camouflage, camouflaging the private universities. So the, whether the students can afford to pay these exorbitant high fees and study in these universities, that question has been entirely sidelined. So, um, I was going through uh, June 2015, I am a student of economics and we have to read this EPW, he is an editor, okay, I have to read this EPW and I was going through a June 2015 issue and it was saying that, and it was an article written by a group of DU and JNU professors and they were saying that how the standardization and homogenization of the syllabus is being seen as an ultimate solution to all the uneven, une, uneven quality. When all these educational institutes, all these private universities, they don't pay any heed to infrastructure, they don't pay any heed to the faculties. And so, uh, a solution to all these problems is introduce standardize, standardization in the education sector. And um, the fact that there has been budget, uh, there, there has been strong fund cuts in the education sector has been totally sidelined. We see that every day, when the budget is added, as it is, the 
the way Mr. Jaitley presents our Vajit, it is totally incomprehensible to the common people. I mean, this is what is the ploy actually. Alienate every subject for the political ring, make academics get money, confine academics within some few air condition halls and so that people are not, so that people can't, um, can't uh, find the linkage between academics and the society in which they are living in. So this is basically a ploy and we see in every budget the funds on education, the funds on higher education is getting cut and cut. But instead of addressing all these issues, we all have all these private universities cropping up and standardization being included. But however, these, in these recent times, I am a bit optimistic because whenever I feel there is an urge, whenever there is an urge to suppress voices, there is always the zeal to fight back and create a new. And this is what is happening all over India. I mean, the students are organizing themselves. They are identifying the different struggles, the caste, the gender struggle, and they are just fighting for it, sometimes even without being meditated by any established political parties. But they are just fighting, they are organizing in various forms and they are fighting against it. They can identify this struggle. So that is, a, so I feel very optimistic about it. And we should identify as an activist, as a student, I think that we should identify ourselves with this tendency in this becoming. And we are seeing how the campuses are playing a major decisive role in the mainstream national politics. And that is why we have Mr. Rahul Gandhi, Yechuri, D. Raja, all flying to the campuses and fighting among themselves in the parliament and the assemblies because they are seeing how the campuses are playing a very important role. So, this was what I wanted to say basically. And before concluding, I just want to mention a few things. Being a student of economics, I am very wary about the way market works. And this market has a strong capacity of accommodating every form of dissent while continuing exploitation. As it is the freedom of speech and dissent which the constitution awards us as citizens is very much limited. In the sense that when a farmer analyzes the events why there has been two years of consecutive droughts in a um, sorry, this has been two years, yeah, two years of consecutive droughts in a century and what should be the possible remedies to get out of it and when a Mr. Certain Arun, and when a Mr. Arun Jaitley comes and announces in budget how the relief assistance should be, these two opinions are never taken on the same level because superiority on the basis of caste, creed, education always creeps in. Yeah. And so the freedom of speech, expression which we are all shouting about should always have, I believe, I firmly believe an advocate should always have a left axis, a revolutionary left axis perhaps because otherwise we would be shouting on our farmers' distress, while the government will say that it had every right to discuss who the brand ambassadors of the broad free state should be. So, the market ideology has always uh, has a liberal ideology that promotes all kinds of consumer sovereignty, freedom, but it actually what it does is it reshapes our thinking and our concepts of freedom to serve its own profit and self-interest. Um, so that's it, that's all I have to say. And in Bengali, actually, the organizer, organizers have taken this wonderful, wonderful, um, uh, has created this wonderful opportunity for us to all come and share our experience, whoever we are, um, so how, how little way we are asso uh, associated with academics. In Bengali, actually, we, we say Shongrami Obhimandun. That's uh, That means uh, salute to the fighting zeal of the organizers. And that is all I have to say to it. I don't know the literal translation of that, but that is so. I'm very. Um